This week, cleaning up the social network, getting your mask on, and breaking bad with Giancarlo Esposito. Hey, welcome to Click and wear a mask. If that's the advice you're given, just do it. It's not a problem. And in fact, in some parts of the world, it's just the norm anyway. So do it. Hey, Lara. Hello. I hope you've been bending the metal bit over your nose. Now I know about it, it seems really obvious. No, you're absolutely right. And I didn't know that until very recently. And it does help it to sit in place. So very useful information. It does help, but it still doesn't fit perfectly, although I may have a solution for that later in the programme. Now, it's been a busy week in the world of tech. The UK government has decided to remove all of Huawei's 5G kit from the country by 2027. This is a decision with political ramifications and it will also likely delay the rollout of 5G here by two or three years. Huawei said the move was bad news for anyone in the UK with a mobile phone. And then there's Facebook, not just a place for staying in touch with people, but also somewhere where you can share the news that you think is important and the opinions that you want others to hear about. Even if they're unfair, untrue or offensive. Which often they are. Every social network is battling the issue of trying to moderate content. And for Facebook, as the biggest, well, there's an issue of even more influence and even more responsibility to clean up its act. And that's exactly what it says it's trying to do. Now, it's setting up an independent oversight board to help it with some of the trickiest issues on the platform. In a few minutes, I'm going to be talking to one of the members of that oversight board. But first, here's James Clayton with a reminder of how Facebook got here. There was a time before Russian bots and Cambridge Analytica and deep fakes when the internet was seen as a more innocent place. A liberator, despots and tyrants would no longer stifle criticism. Freedom and free speech would abound. And initially, social media was seen through that lens too. The Arab Spring, which was in part organised through online platforms, seemed to back that up. But that spring soon turned into a nightmare, and thousands of miles away in Myanmar, Facebook was about to get a sharp reality check. Facebook is wildly popular in that country, but hate exploded against the country's Rohingya Muslims on the platform in the run-up to the ethnic cleansing there. Why not? Yeah, and in the 2016 not? US elections and the Brexit vote, it was heavily criticised for allowing voters to be targeted with ultra-personalised ads. In the last few years, Facebook has found itself desperately trying to escape a mounting list of criticism. For example, that not enough was being done to take down hateful, Islamophobic, racist and anti-Semitic content. No, I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. Trump tweets like this one, incorrectly talking up postal voting fraud, were left up. Critics also argue that conspiracy theories, for example, that coronavirus was man-made, a so-called pandemic, weren't taken down quickly enough. And during the George Floyd protest, one video calling Floyd a horrible human being was one of the most watched Facebook videos during the protests. This is the company defending that. We have been working in, the, in this area in particular for many years, and we're actually investing millions in teams and systems to, uh, to improve on this area. And we've made substantial changes. If we look at particularly the area of, of hate speech, uh, we now our systems uh, and detect and remove 90% of that hate speech automatically. That all leads us to where we are now. Criticism has turned into action. A stop hate for profit campaign has led to hundreds of companies pulling their ads from Facebook in the month of July. Technology uh, that 
can bring us into the future, which is in so many ways dragging us into the past. They have created um, a set of incentive structures and algorithms that incentivize people to spread hate, that monetize um, hateful, violent content. Here's Facebook's defense though. Some of these decisions, whether to take down content or not, are hard. At what point does clamping down on dangerous views become an illiberal erosion of free speech? It's a question that Facebook doesn't really want to have to answer. That is why Facebook has set up an oversight committee. Think of it as a court where the defendant is the Facebook video or user. The committee is the judge and jury. We believe that Facebook alone shouldn't be deciding what is or isn't acceptable online, which is why we've been working to find a new way for people to appeal certain content decisions. Even the concept of early voting is the They'll decide whether political candidates ads have gone too far, what is and isn't fake news, and the line between hate and the right for people to articulate their views. Considering more than 2 billion people actively use Facebook and Instagram, this committee has huge power, but only in theory. Facebook is broadly trying to move in the right direction, because Facebook doesn't want to be regulated. And Facebook has stands to have a lot more to lose if Trump were to bring in legislation. So the more that Facebook can avoid being regulated, obviously, the better. And things like the Oversight Committee and the Audit uh, and all of these things help them do this. Others, though, believe that the committee will have no actual teeth because of the power Mark Zuckerberg still has. And be able to give any feedback they want on the rules. Because Mark controls the organization. So these oversight boards, people putting themselves on committees, um, putting their years of work um, um, sort of on display, um, I think it's a huge mistake for these individuals because unless they're going to change uh, the infrastructure um, and change the sort of incentives, then you're um, not actually going to change how things roll out. It's like saying you're a member of Congress but not actually having a vote on the floor. That was James Clayton, and I'm joined online now by one of the members of the new Facebook Oversight Board. This is Alan Rusbridger. He is the ex-editor-in-chief of The Guardian newspaper in the UK. So you're one of 20 members initially announced on this board. Are you happy with the mix of members that there are? It's a very interesting mix in terms of geographical location, diversity of outlook, diversity of ethnicity. It's... Um, so you've got a sort of interesting bunch of lawyers, human rights activists, academics, journalists, um, troublemakers. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> it's quite a sort of interesting, if, if you wanted a quiet life, I don't think you would have chosen this board. What did Facebook say to you to persuade you to take this job? I mean, we're facing a crisis of, of um, truth, of, 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 of trust, of knowing what's true and what's not true. Uh, and as somebody who um, kind of passionately believed in the, 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 the dream and the, the opportunity that the internet uh, offered, uh, it's been very sad to see it, it get into a certain degree of trouble. Um, so the, the idea of having a kind of independent board of people who could help what are basically a, you know, it's a highly talented bunch of engineers think through the moral, legal, editorial, uh, ethical considerations that they're having to wrestle with. Uh, if we could pull that off, that would be an incredibly valuable thing to do. I, I know lots of people are skeptical skeptic, skeptic about whether we will, but, but, but it's certainly worth a try. Are you paid by Facebook? Yeah. And I mean, that obviously is going to give you a, an extra challenge when, when people try and decide whether this is actually a, a genuine attempt by Facebook to, you know, to regulate. Yeah, well, regulate. when I say, am I paid by Facebook? I mean, the, 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 what Facebook has done is to set up a separate, uh, like a trust. Um, and um, although for the first few meetings there were Facebook people in the room, there are now no Facebook people in the room. And, and it feels as though we are now an independent entity. So... Have you any idea at the moment what kind of things you'll be looking at? I think uh, Facebook will come to us and say, look, here's a particularly thorny problem that we, we would appreciate your guidance on. 
I think users, uh, I expect there will be a, a, a big uh, demand from, from, from users of Facebook. Of course, the number of potential individual complaints from users will be far too high for such a small board. It's most likely that instead they'll be asked to advise on more general procedures. And at that point, Facebook itself will also have a say in whether to implement any changes. If it turned out that Facebook uh, consistently ignored those kind of recommendations, then it would send very clear signals. But, but as, as I said, that's not the sense I get of the relationship that Facebook wants or, or why it's bothered to set up this board in the first place. Are you confident that you can make the kind of difference you want to? Or at the moment, is it still you're, you're finding out whether this is possible at all? It would be a foolish person who went into this uh, saying, look, we're going we're gonna to crack this. It, it, it may not be possible to crack, but, but it seems to me better to have a go than, than some of the alternatives. You know, the, the, the alternatives are either going to be to, uh, uh, to bring in some kind of regulation, but what does that mean? Does that mean you know, Turkish regulation, Pakistani regulation, Saudi Arabian regulation? I mean, do you have multiple forms of regulation, in which case uh, you are losing some kind of utopian dream of en enabling people for whom companies like Facebook are a lifeline? But the problems Facebook has go far beyond what is on the platform. Like some other social networks, the biggest criticism of it is in the way it's designed its algorithm, which prioritises clicks for revenue and pushes more extreme content to the top to get more engagement. If the board could say, well, actually, uh, there's, a, there's a more important metric, which is X, uh, that should affect your algorithm, that would be an interesting conversation to start getting into. Is it important that we have our own uh, advisors who can say, well, actually, they, they, they could do that, tell them to do it, uh, um, because we don't want to make um, uh, recommendations that, that simply won't make sense or are, are unachievable. Do you know when this will be up and running at the moment? Because there's a question over whether it will be in place in time for the elections in the US in November. Um, w whether we will be there and operational and making key decisions on, on some of the hot potatoes around the um, uh, election, I don't know. It would be damaging to the project to, um, to come out with, with half-baked recommendations now before we're ready. Um, mm. uh, these are huge intractable problems. Um, uh, and I, I know everybody wants them sorted out by next Tuesday, but I can't think of, of a, any body of people that's, that is going to find this, the, the, these uh, e easy problems to solve. Hypothetically, if you get you know, two or three years down the road and you find that they were just wanting this, as you call it, a fig leaf, uh, would you all resign? If after two or three years it, it's, it's, it's evident that, that we're not having much impact, then uh, I, I guess a number of board members would think, well, is, is this really um, uh, worth it? And, and it, it, yeah, is it worth it? Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that one of America's oldest fast food chains, White Castle, announced it will trial the Flippy robot in one of its Chicago outlets in September. Chinese company Oppo announced super fast 125 watt charging for mobile phones with the possibility of fully charging a battery in 20 minutes. And researchers at Carnegie Mellon showed off a new technique for robots to learn how to grab shiny and transparent objects using a new color camera system. It was also the week that high profile Twitter accounts were compromised in an apparent Bitcoin scam. Twitter accounts affected included President Obama, Joe Biden, Elon Musk, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, and Bill Gates. Twitter said it was aware of a security incident impacting accounts and were investigating it. The body of tech CEO and entrepreneur Fahim Saleh was found apparently decapitated and dismembered in a flat in New York. Mr. Saleh was the founder of Bangladesh-based Pathau and Nigerian motorbike sharing startup Gokada. MIT's C-Sale team demonstrated a robotic gripper, complete with soft, sensitive fingers handling cables with dexterity. The team anticipates future applications could include tying knots or even completing surgical stitches. And finally, another robot companion made its debut this week. Meet Stretch RE1. Designed by an ex-Google employee, the 23-kilo robot can help with housework and even play with the dog. Stretch is the first machine released from Hello Robot.
Now, I don't know about you, but as face coverings have started to become a normal part of life, I've been struggling to find one that fits and stays on. This slides off my nose. This is baggy around the ears. So could a personalised 3D printed one like this be the solution? Part of the COVID, we've seen uh, a few companies uh, coming up with 3D printing solutions. But uh, one common problem we find is that uh, these masks are not customized, so they are universal uh, size and shape. Not these, though. This Imperial College London research project repurposes custom-fit 3D printed masks, a concept they were originally working on for people suffering with sleep apnea. Now they hope to create perfect fitting respirators at a time when it seems we could be wearing them a lot. And all you need to get started is a smartphone. First thing I need to do is scan my face. There are a couple of iOS apps that seem to work to do this. The first up is called Scandi Pro. I'm going to have to hold very still. Although it was a little fiddly to get the image right, I'm told that this app is especially accurate. There's also Bellus 3D, which I thought was simpler to use. And Virtual Me did look pretty realistic. I guess I'll just find out how the mask fits when it actually arrives. Currently, you do need an iPhone 10 or above to carry out this process, but alternatives are being looked into, including some for Android users. Job done. You then upload your scan to the Mensura Mask website. Specially created code is used to extract the necessary data, and that is sent to Autodesk's Fusion 360 platform to tweak and rebuild the model to fit your face. This should provide you with a free file of your mask to print. Now, assuming you don't have a 3D printer in your living room, there are plenty of companies out there that can print it for you at the cost of a round of fiver. But whilst we might all like a better fitting mask that doesn't steam up our glasses, the real aim of this project is a much bigger picture. So right now, the masks that you can, you can wear, they're just as good as a face covering, if not better. Um, but we, as we get better, as we get the technology more mature, we will go through that certification process to check that the materials are safe, to check that the filters work properly. Of course, the outcome of each individual mask will not just depend on an accurate scan, but also the quality of the 3D printing. So, the mask has arrived. Can we have the grand unveiling? Ta -da! Wow, that's very space age actually. How does it feel and how does it fit? It definitely fits well. I can feel it absolutely moulded to my face and I think any glasses would be okay, no steaming up. But um, rather bizarrely, my ears keep popping. Well, I mean, I can tell it's really airtight because your voice hardly makes it out of the mask. Can you breathe? I mean, that's, that's a filter in the end, isn't it? It is, and actually these filters would need changing every day, but they're just standard ones that you can buy online and the whole mask can be fully disinfected. Is it comfortable at all? Well, it certainly fits just right and the edges do feel quite soft. So I think if I worked at a job where I had to wear this all day, then I can see the benefit. But it does feel a little bit over the top to just go and buy some groceries. Right, let's move on. Now, because the E3 video games mega trade show was cancelled this year, games companies have been doing their launches at online events instead. And last week saw one of the biggest online showcases, the Ubisoft Forward event. But it coincided with three of the company's executives having to resign over an investigation into sexual misconduct. Now, the gaming world has for years been overshadowed by examples of abuse and toxic behaviour. And Mark Chislak reports now on how it's not just the pandemic that's been disrupting the video games industry. Games mega publisher Ubisoft is currently mired in an abuse scandal centred around its studios. The company put out a tweet before its latest online showcase acknowledging that it wouldn't be addressing these issues during its event. More on that later. At the event itself, the company did reveal the casting of Giancarlo Esposito of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame as the villain in the latest Far Cry title. Our people 
Esposito has been cast as a dictator called Anton Castillo, ruler of the fictitious island Yara in the first-person shooter Far Cry 6. The player assumes the role of a guerrilla fighter, attempting to take down the dictator and his government from the island's jungles to the streets of its capital city. I spoke with the actor about donning a performance capture rig to create a villain who is more than a scenery-chewing end-of-level boss. You've played several characters in recent years who've had a quiet menace about them. Did you bring that to this game or have you gone in another direction? I always believe that quiet menace is, is uh, and reflective menace is the most frightening menace. So you tell me. Good art often makes us think about our world and what's going on in our own lives. Do you think that this game has the potential to affect the player in that way? Oh my goodness, what a great question. I actually do. You know, I feel like this storyline is really powerful. Um, and without giving anything away, there, it's about relationships, father and son. Everything I feel like I do has some sort of a social uh, imprint. My guess is that some of the stuff I thank God I've been involved with, with Saul and, and, and uh, Better Call Saul, of course, another show I do, and Breaking Bad and Godfather of Harlem, st statements are in these projects. And certainly there is a statement you can find in this game. What did you think of the virtual version of you that's been created for the game? I was blown away. I, I literally argued with them. I stood there and went, oh, you're full of garbage. If, if that's me, then why don't you just film me? Like, what? How did we do that? We all go boom. We're yet to see any gameplay, but the title's slated for release in February 2021. But recent real-world events in Ubisoft Studios and Boardroom have cast a shadow over the company's activities. So over the past couple of weeks, uh, many women and other people working in the games industry have come forward with stories about workplace bullying or harassment. Uh, and that runs the gamut from toxic workplace culture right through to sexual harassment. And quite early in this wave of allegations, Ubisoft names started coming up again and again. This has led to several dismissals and resignations, with two senior executives resigning and a third leaving their post just before last weekend's showcase. Ubisoft gave us this statement when asked for comment. These recent claims describe workplace behaviours that are simply unacceptable. We do not and will not tolerate abuse, harassment or discrimination of any kind. Upon learning of these allegations, we immediately launched independent investigations and have already announced a series of measures aimed at driving profound changes within the company, as well as several significant personnel changes. The problem in a lot of creative um, industries, not just games, where you have these superstar creative people who are seen as untouchable and who are seen as indispensable to their companies. And sometimes that can create an environment in which those people feel like they can get away with anything. Ubisoft is not the only publisher with, with workplace problems. Last year, Riot Games came under the spotlight. Um, there was a, a lawsuit launched against them by ex-employees alleging sexist discrimination at that workplace it has caused big ripples throughout the games industry. As we approach the next console generation and video games achieve ever greater artistic and technical heights, it seems that the games industry still has work to do in regard to how it conducts its affairs in the real world. That was Mark and that's it for this week. Yes, as ever, you can keep up with the team throughout the week on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching. Mask up if you're asked and we'll see you next time. Bye.